understanding income statements. In this reading, we talk about components and format of the income statement, the rules of revenue recognition and expense recognition, non-recurring items and non-operating items, the concept of earnings per share. We then conclude the reading with a discussion on the analysis of the income statement and the concept of comprehensive income. The income statement has several names. It is also referred to as the profit and loss statement, the PNL, and the statement of earnings. The income statement provides financial results of a company's business activities over a period. So you will always see an income statement for a given quarter or a given year. The basic formula for the income statement is as follows. Net income is equal to the revenue minus expenses. And as you have probably figured out, the income statement is an important input for valuation models. It's not the only input, but it is one of the more important inputs. Components and format of the income statement. The top line on the income statement is the revenue line shown right here. Other names for revenue include sales and turnover. Next, we see what's called net revenue or net sales. In certain situations, a company might sell, but there can be returns. Once we subtract the returns, we have a net revenue number. Certain companies might sell through agents and those agents charge commissions. When we subtract the commission, then also we are left with net revenue or net sale. The income statement will show both cash expenses and non-cash expenses. So for example, here we might say that cost of goods sold is mostly a cash expense. Sales, general and administrative expenses also might largely be cash expenses. Depreciation, on the other hand, is a non-cash charge. We subtract these expenses, which are generally called operating expenses, and we are left with operating profit. This is also referred to as EBIT, or earnings before interest and taxes. Then we subtract interest, and we have earnings before taxes. Subtract taxes, and we end up with net income. This is a really simple income statement. Single step versus multi-step format that we will discuss on the next slide. What you see on the left is a single step format and on the right we have a multi-step format. The subtle difference is that in a multi-step format we subtract cost of goods sold and come up with a gross profit number. In this case, that number is half a million. Whereas in a single step format, we do not have a number for gross profit. So you notice that on the left, this gross profit item is missing. Obviously, it can be calculated easily by simply subtracting 500,000 from a million. But in terms of describing this format, we say that this is a single step format. Coming now to revenue recognition, which is a very important topic. Just as a general point, first of all, in IFRS, the term income includes both revenue and gains. And gains generally refers to gains on the sale of equipment or other long-term assets. So a company which is in the business of selling laptops will report a revenue number based on the sale of laptops. The company might also sell a piece of equipment and realize a gain. So an equipment with a book value of 100 might be sold for 110. This gain of 10 would be shown on the income statement as a gain. And all this top bullet point is saying is that the term income applies to both the core revenue of the company as well as gains. Now coming to the concept of revenue recognition. When a company sells goods, can it recognize revenue in the period where it quote-unquote sells? 
if a company sells goods for 100 cash in period one and has no refund policy, can it recognize revenue in period one? And the answer is an unambiguous yes, because clearly the goods have been sold. The customer cannot return the goods and the customer has paid cash. So clearly the company can show revenue of 100 for period one. Let's look at the second scenario now. What if the company sells goods on credit in period one and will receive cash in period two? Can revenue be recognized in period one? So this is period one, period two. The goods are sold over here, but cash will be received later. So where do we recognize revenue, period one or period two? Accounting rules say that you can recognize revenue in period one as long as you are sure that money will be received. So the answer to this question is that revenue should be recognized in period one. There are more details, but we will see them later. What if an advanced payment is received in period one? but goods and services are to be delivered in period two. When will the revenue be recognized? So we have a slightly different situation here. In period one, we get the cash, but the goods will actually be delivered in the second period. Here, we cannot recognize the revenue in period one because the goods and services have not been delivered. It's only in period two when goods and services are delivered we can recognize revenue. As we've seen over the last few slides, revenue recognition rules are different under IFRS and US GAAP. This makes it difficult to compare IFRS versus US GAAP companies. In 2014, IASB and FASB issued converged accounting standards and here we are going to talk about the key aspects of the revenue recognition aspect of the new standards. Under IFRS, these new standards take effect for periods starting 1st January 2018. And under US GAAP, the date is 15th December 2017. First, let's understand the core principle of the converged standard. Now, this is again with respect to revenue recognition. So the principle is this. Revenue should be recognized to depict the transfer of promised goods or services to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled in an exchange for those goods or services. So if we have a given entity, this sells goods or services to a customer, the goods or services are delivered and the entity either receives payment or expects to receive payment for the goods and services rendered. Then the company can recognize revenue. So that's the principle, but clearly more detail is needed. So let's understand the five steps in revenue recognition. Step one is to identify the contract or contracts with a customer. A contract is an agreement and commitment with commercial substance between two parties. It establishes each party's obligations and rights, including payment terms. A contract exists only if collectability is probable. Step two, identify the performance obligations in the contract. The performance obligations within a contract represent promises to transfer distinct goods or services. A good or service is distinct if number one, the customer can benefit from it on its own or in combination with readily available resources and number two if the promise to transfer it can be separated from other promises in the contract. Let's understand the application of this step through an example. Let's say we have a company called Builder Co and this enters into a contract with another company called Customer Co. The contract is to construct a commercial building. 
Builder Co. identifies various goods and services to be provided and these include pre-construction engineering, construction of the building's individual components, plumbing, electrical wiring and interior finishes. So all these are given as separate goods and services. Now here is the question. With respect to identifying performance obligations, can each of these items pre-construction engineering, the construction of individual components, plumbing and so on. So can each of these items be treated as separate performance obligations with respect to revenue recognition? So let's go back to these two criteria and this is an AND condition. For a given good or service to be distinct or to be a particular performance obligation, the customer should be able to benefit from it on its own or along with other readily available resources and the promise to transfer this particular good or service can be separated from other promises in the contract. In the example that I just gave which comes from the curriculum, this condition is not met because the contract is to construct a commercial building. And if that is the contract, then these specific items like pre-construction engineering cannot be separated from other promises in the contract. Therefore, these items do not in of themselves represent performance obligations. Step 3 is to determine the transaction price. Step 4 is to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations in the contract. Now, in my earlier example, there was only one performance obligation. Let's take another scenario. Say a software company sells a product and a consulting service, which are two separate performance obligations. Then here in step four, we allocate a price to each of these performance obligations. And then in step five, Revenue is recognized when the entity satisfies a performance obligation. So let's say the product is delivered upfront, then the revenue can be recognized once this product has been delivered. Let's say that the service is rendered over a one year period. So for this service, the revenue is recognized as this performance obligation is fulfilled. Now I'll give another example related to revenue recognition. Let's say we have a long-term contract and we go back to build a company which is let's say constructing a building over a two-year period for customer company. And in this case the overall contract price is 1 million and let's say that the expected total cost is 700,000. If during the first year the cost incurred is 420,000 and the cost incurred is a reasonable indication of the percentage of completion, then the amount of revenue that can be recognized over the first year is 420,000 divided by 700,000 into 1 million. This gives us 600,000 which means that 600,000 can be recognized as revenue in the first year. Notice that what we have actually done is essentially the percentage of completion method and with this new standard the term percentage of completion is not used but effectively we are doing the same thing. This new converged standard also gives guidance on how to deal with variable consideration. So for example, if the customer says to the entity that if the project is completed on time, then there will be a performance bonus of 200,000. So how should this be accounted? The existing standards do not give sufficient guidance on how to deal with this variable consideration. But according to the new standard, a company is allowed to recognize variable consideration if it can conclude that it will not have to reverse the cumulative revenue in the future. Next point, and this is something new in the converged standard. 
companies should capitalize incremental costs of obtaining a contract so let's say that a company is pursuing a large government contract and in order to get that contract the company has to incur an additional fee of 50000 in the current standard this 50000 might be expensed but according to the new converged standard this 50000 should be capitalized in other words an asset needs to be created there are also certain other costs which are incurred in order to fulfill a contract which need to be capitalized. The curriculum doesn't specify what costs exactly need to be capitalized, but you just need to recognize that any cost incurred to obtain the contract and certain other costs to fulfill the contract have to be capitalized. The final couple of points have to do with disclosure. The disclosure requirements are more elaborate with the converged standard and here are a couple of points that you need to know so companies should disclose information about contracts with customers disaggregated into different categories of contracts so these categories can be based on customer types on geography on contract types or on pricing terms Companies should disclose balances of any contract related assets and liabilities and significant changes in those balances, remaining performance obligations and transaction price allocated to those obligations and any significant judgments and changes in judgments related to revenue. The curriculum doesn't spend much time on this, but very briefly contract related assets. So there might be situations where a company has delivered a performance obligation, has recognized revenue, but not created an accounts receivable yet. So until the time that the accounts receivable is created, a contract related asset can be created, which eventually then gets converted into an accounts receivable. Now, a detailed understanding of contract related assets and liabilities are not required under the learning outcomes but the brief comment that I gave you right now should be good enough. The larger point is that the disclosure requirements are more rigorous with the new converged standard.